Around the world, one million plastic drinking bottles are purchased every minute. In just one year, five trillion single-use plastic bags are used worldwide. And a staggering eight million tons of plastic end up in the world's ocean. More than 80% of this ocean plastic originates from land-based sources. If current trends continue, our ocean could contain more plastic than fish by 2050. But the world is waking up to the need for innovative solutions. And national and local governments, as well as industry leaders, are taking action. Again. Well, this brings us to our final thematic panel. As you just saw from that heartbreaking video, the world is drowning in plastic pollution. It is found at the top of the highest mountains on, on the planet and at the bottom of the deepest part of the ocean, and even in us, in our bodies. Just last month, the world came together in Nairobi to agree to begin to negotiate a global treaty to combat plastic pollution. The time is now for solutions and for new approaches. So on behalf of the US government, I'm very excited to announce two new commitments. First, we are making a commitment of $200 million for marine debris assessment, prevention, mitigation, and removal activities over the next five years. The commitment will be carried out through NOAA, and it will fund innovative marine debris prevention projects that change behavior, develop capacity, and encourage creative solutions to minimize the amount and the impact of marine plastic. The second commitment is $48 million for the new USAID Clean Cities Blue Ocean Program to prevent ocean plastic pollution by building capacity and commitment of local institutions to reduce, reuse, and recycle the three R's, three, three R's, and better manage solid waste in riverine and coastal cities. This program works in 25 cities in seven countries, ranging from large countries to small island states. These are just two of the commitments the United States is bringing to combat ocean pollution. And let me just take a minute here to give a shout out to all the institutions, governments, organizations who brought commitments to this ocean conference. That's what makes this conference so special and so unique, is this bringing commitments element of it. And not everyone can make their commitments from the side of the stage as, as you've seen all day. There are so many, and I don't want to give away the number or the amount, but stay tuned. It's big. <laughs> so now let's get to the panel. Professor Robert Richmond of the University of Hawaii at Manoa is our moderator for our panel on marine pollution, including plastic pollution. Please join me in welcoming Professor Richmond. Uh, excellencies, uh, distinguished delegates, friends and colleagues. Uh, my name is Bob Richmond. I'm a research professor and director of the Kuala Marine Laboratory at the University of Hawaii at Manoa and a proud member of the board of directors of the Palau International Coral Reef Center, which we'll be holding, uh, hosting tonight's reception. Uh, to everyone, I'd like to introduce today's panel, uh, Tania Puspa Lestari, the founder and executive director of Divers Clean Action, Si Chin Chang, the Minister of the Environmental Protection Administration for the Government of Taiwan, Nick Strong Svetic, the CEO of Save the Waves Coalition, Simon Bennett, the General Manager of Sustainable Developments, Wire Shipping, and Ingrid Geskis, the Director of Global Ghost Gear, uh, Ghost Gear Initiative for the Ocean Conservancy. Thank you very much, panelists. <laughs> So by way of introduction, uh, marine pollution is clearly one of the uh, real issues that we're all concerned about um, at the local and at the global level. 
And as we look at the rogues gallery list here, uh, plastics most people are very familiar with, um, petroleum products, nutrients, pesticides, pharmaceuticals, personal care products are often uh, underrepresented or under misunderstood, which can be very important, heavy metals and radionuclides. In the uh, photos on the panel, um, the top left is certainly plastic pollution we've seen. Uh, the top right is an oil spill from a nearby island, Yap Island, that occurred um, about 15 years ago. Um, we often see land-based sources of pollution with runoff in the middle left panel, uh, where you can see sediment, but you can't see all of the pesticides and agrochemicals that are included. Um, in the middle right panel is a sewer outfall from the island of Guam. Um, it's a freshwater effluent that surfaces 100% of the time, and it often contains many things, including uh, everything from estrogenic compounds tied to unmetabolized birth control pills to a number of pharmaceuticals, uh, notably painkillers, um, a number of antibiotics, which wreak havoc with the uh, marine microbiome and other chemicals that can really influence the ability of organisms in the ocean to reproduce. The estrogenic compounds in particular can confuse uh, spawning aggregations in fish. Uh, the lower left-hand panel is a nuclear detonation from the Marshall Islands and a Weetok Atoll where I spent two years. Uh, radionuclides are things that have been of concern to the Pacific for many years, and uh, there are additional issues that have come up most recently uh, with Fukushima and plans for release of water into the ocean. And we often uh, don't look at things like sound pollution and light pollution gets, can certainly affect things as well. Um, there are a number of ways in which pollutants act. There are modes of action, including outright toxicity, endocrine disruption, um, genetic damage, and reproductive inhibition. And uh, the main point in my laboratory, we say that mortality is a rather crude estimator of stress. We often use death as the indicator that something is wrong, but proof of life is not proof of health. And in the coral reef world, where I spend most of my time, we have large old corals that are simply non-reproductive. We call them zombie corals, because even though they exist, they no longer reproduce or add to the replenishment of populations. Um, that beautiful map to the right um, is uh, what's called a keg metabolic pathway map. Uh, we have new tools in contemporary science that enable us to move from correlation to causation. Um, this is definitely a work of art. Uh, this could replace any Picasso on somebody's wall. Um, but what it is here is simply every bar of red you see there is a protein that was turned on by corals that were moved from an outside site to a watershed discharge, showing all the metabolic processes that were inhibited uh, by the pollutants in the water. Everything from lipid formation for eggs um, to detoxification pathways, even oxidative stress. And we see there are a lot of synergism and antagonisms with things like global climate change as water temperatures increase and the pH goes down. Many of these chemicals have uh, increased solubility and increased toxicity to organisms. Um, the science has gone way beyond just identifying problems. That's been the easy part. Uh, the most important part now is identifying solutions, hence the value of conferences like that. And for solutions to work, uh, they need to meet three major criteria, certainly here in the Pacific. They first and foremost need to be effective. They need to be economically feasible. And for these islands, they need to be culturally acceptable. Um, this uh, bottom uh, photo all the way to the left is a taro field here in Palau, a project that was run by the Palau International Coral Reef Center, showing that indeed a lot of marine pollution and coastal pollution begins on land. And it turns out that uh, taro fields and mangroves are incredibly valuable in filtering the uh, kind of pollutants that come off of land and into the ocean. And this is a perfect solution to show by moving taro fields from the low-lying areas where they get flooded when typhoons come, tied to global climate change and sea level rise. Uh, they're 60 to 90% effective in trapping sediment and all the pollutants and toxicants that are carried with sediment into the ocean. Um, the other kinds of concerns we see uh, in the panels to the right, uh, the upper one is showing group fishing. Um, we look at ways of trying to get more pelagics into, certainly the diets or the restaurants. Um, the pelagics below that, if you look in Palau, you'll see posters saying choose pelagics to try to remove some of the pressure on coastal fisheries. But the problem with pelagics right now is that large tuna, a child under the age of six should have no more than one three ounce serving per month. And that's due to marine pollution, due to mercury. And to me, that's a really devastating thought. 
Um, answers to these problems include the panels on the right. That's Minister Victor teaching uh, community college faculty from the Pacific how to do water quality monitoring. And Dr. Yim Nangolbu, the head of the Palau International Coral Reef Center, teaching the next generation of scientists. So at this point, I would like to introduce our panelists to give their presentations. And our first panel member is Tania Puspa Lestari. Thank you. Tania. Ali uh, Gotong Royong is an Indonesian principal to collaborate, do actions, but in a mutual assistance so it can be more effective. And for the past six years I've been working in this, this principle is really important to combat marine debris issue. As an islander myself, I experienced the problem um, firsthand. As a scuba diver who found not only plastic, but also like big bad, refrigerator, television during cleanup. Back in 2015, I understand that there are gaps between the knowledge that I learned during environmental engineering class and also the reality that I face in the islands. We cannot only do cleanup every day because it needs like a more complex integrated solutions on ground. And it is unfair how the local community was asked to do more combative actions, but they have limited resources, knowledge, and then also facilities. And sometimes they don't even have an integrated or even a uh, waste management system. Under the spirit of Gotong Royong, I asked my fellow peers, professors, to help me understand more on how youth can help escalate the solutions needed on grassroots level. With all hands on deck, we created this crazy mind map to build diverse clean action. But from these two, it struck me that actually Indonesia has done a lot. But sometimes it needs international collaborations. And sadly, not a lot of news covering this and even youth efforts behind that. To give you a real um, evidence of youth efforts on ground, DCA's volunteers, collaborator, and then also partners took part for scalable impacts, varying from scientific and citizen research activities, such as microplastic sampling, modeling, even social science, to reduction efforts, such as single-use plastic free national march that now documents nationwide restaurants, implements no straw movement, and also more than 50 cities and alike to ban single-use plastic bags. Or, the right one or the left one, uh, emerging reduction refill stalls businesses that minimize thousands of single-use plastic sachets waste per month from its sources. And for recycling, we collaborate with partners to recycle single-use plastics into building materials or even clothes. Working together with waste banks to make sure more villages separate and recycle their waste so the woman there can actually gain income and have access to financial literacy and they are free from the temptations of loan sharks. Understanding that youth are behind those collaborations uh, and solutions, especially after knowing more that youth all over the world is actually done a lot, and I need to give a shout out to youth. Hi, youth. <laughs> we found similar bottleneck issues. First, the policies are not yet forced and incentivize transformation of circular economy. And second, the uneven willingness and commitment in each area's leaders that may hinder the behavior change process. And sadly, we'll never get far if the changes on these are so slow. The unique thing is, youth is not only focusing on the problem, but also trying to address the solutions and not wait. First, by monitoring the transformation closely on grassroots level through capacity buildings and advocacy. Second, by bridging the working in silos problems and translating like the complex how and what to do for each multi-stakeholder, such as what we do from you know, thousands of papers of commitments from each stakeholders into an interactive and inclusive video web series and even a clear diagram of job distribution table for the yearly action plan for the reference of budget for the government and all par parties involved. Even though we need 
to get through 12 focus group, group discussions to, to make this, but it is really worth it because now every department know what to do and it's in the technical uh, grassroots level. Advocating through high level dialogues like today and getting constructive support from task forces and collaborations like USAID, YCLE, Finla, BEMSA from Germany, National and Global Plastic Action Partnership and other parties and also from the UK, the NERC Research um, and National Geographic Society, it really enables us youth to make DCA can work professionally and closely in grassroots level. But the private sector, yes, they work together and collaborated with us, uh, but they are not yet obliged to reduce, redesign, and do the EPR now. But we cannot wait like for 2030 or 2050, right? Because the mangrove that we clean up, it will, you know, stack up until 30 centimeters if we are not doing a cleanup just for one month. So we need the solutions now. And these are the other false solutions problems which we need your help to regulate. I did actually have uh, the discussion with the ADB fellows uh, earlier, and they say to address these problems, it needs political commitment. But I will talk a lot about this during the question and answer session. Because with time uh, that thinking, I'd also want to highlight that please make the youth retain the earth optimism and get out of this eco-anxiety that we're feeling during the pandemic especially by making sure that no unemployment concerns that make us youth have to choose between the you know, uh, green jobs like this innovating or business as usual and stuck with the usual ways. To wrap up, I am inviting everyone to start the gotong royong spirit in every institutions you work on. Do not expect youth to change the tides into more effective actions later. As you've learned today, we are actually committed to continue doing what we do now and growing. But it cannot be effective if it's not from your help. Let's sweeping in unison like schooling fishes for the sake of ocean. Terima kasih, Mas Ulang. Thank you. Thanks very much for highlighting the need for stakeholders' engagement and the value of youth. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Mr. Ti Ching Chang, the Minister of the Environmental Protection Administration for the Government of Taiwan. Minister. Ali, good afternoon. Like a Palau, Taiwan is an island nation with beautiful coastlines and rich biodiversity. We are also facing the problem of marine pollution. Our solution is cut waste at the source and don't let it enter the ocean. So how do we cut waste at the source? In 1997, Taiwan started a nationwide waste recycling program. Over years, our recycling rate have gradually increased. Currently, our recycling rate is more than 60%. And our recycling rate for PET bottles is more than 90%. Most of the remaining waste is sent to the incinerator to generate electricity. But despite these efforts, some waste still end up on the land and into the ocean. In 2020, the Taiwan EPA and the other agencies launched a project called Salute to the Ocean. This project has committed a budget of more than 220 million US dollars between 2020 and 2023. Through this project, our entire coastline has been adopted by various organizations for cleaning up. In addition, more than 600 interception points were set up in rivers to intercept waste. 
This effort led to remove of over 48,000 metric tons of marine waste in 2021. Another major source of marine waste is fishing gear. Last year, we worked with local government to recycle 168 metric tons of fishing gear. This year, we expect that volume to increase. To further reduce marine plastic, since 2002, we have been restricting the use of disposable plastic. Now, most stores cannot give plastic back to shopper for free. In 2018, we banned cosmetics that contain plastic microbeads. And in 2019, we began banning plastic straw at fast food restaurants and beverage shops. We will continue to reduce our plastic consumption and comply with the UNEP's agreement on plastic reduction planned for 2024. To help Taiwan's business integrate marine waste into a circular economy, the EPA introduced the Marine Debris Recycled Product Label in 2021. This is the world's first government-sponsored product label for recycling marine waste. Taiwan's industrial has also come up with their own solution to deal with marine waste. They have set a goal of plastic containers of non-food items to be made with at least 25% of recycled material by 2025. Even the shirts I'm wearing today, made by Xinguang Corporation, is made from PET bottles from Palau. Reduction of waste at the source and the circular use of waste can help our environmental efforts. We also found that when the public become aware and participate, things can be accomplished more easily. Taiwan will work with other nations so that together we can make our ocean cleaner. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister, for explaining very creative ways to reduce uh, waste through garbage recycling. Our next speaker is Nick strong Fetich, the CEO of Save the Waves Coalition. Nick. All right, thank you all. Ali, it's just truly humbling to be here with everybody and such great speakers. And so to all of the dignitaries and delegates out there, um, we appreciate your attendance here. Uh, to Special Envoy Kerry and the whole State Department, all the organization, thank you for everything you've done to get us here. And then a huge thank you to all of our Palauan friends out there for being such wonderful hosts. And we, uh, we really uh, appreciate all of your patience with us for our traffic jams and weird questions and all that. And, and last, thank you all for uh, staying with us here and for all of your attention, because I know it's been a long two days. So. I wanted to just start off, many times in these discussions about marine pollution, we start off not what we're trying to protect, but what we're trying to protect against. So we've all seen the images of the surfer in the barrel with the trash going over the top of it. We've all seen the turtle where the guy's pulling the plastic straw out of its nose, and it's, it, it can be incredibly depressing. And I think in the, in the litany of terrible news that we're used to, to digesting on a daily basis, we lose track of what's important and why we really love the ocean. So I wanted to start off with this picture, 
which is, is pure joy, and to remind us that the ocean is more than just the blue economy. It's more than just the source of protein. It's more than just the oxygen. It's a source of joy and of well-being. And during these pandemic times, that is almost as important as those economic inputs. So I want to talk about that joy and that well-being and the stoke, as we say in the surf world, um, because that's, I think, what surfers do on a daily basis, is go out and try to chase that feeling that she's experiencing right there every time we go into the ocean. So on the practical sense, surfing is also a sport that came from the, sp the Pacific. Thank you, Hawaiians. And, uh, but now it's a sport that's practiced by over 35 million people worldwide in 40 plus countries. It has a collective economic impact of about $60 billion annually in terms of surf, sustainable surf tourism. And so we really think that this is a powerful constituency for marine conservation and the reduction of land-based pollution. Because when a surfer gets sick from contaminated water, it's pretty much instantaneous. And we are basically the canaries in the coal mine of marine pollution and climate change. So why surfing is really because I think that we can engage and be a solution and a new constituency that has not been engaged traditionally in effective marine conservation. So our mission at Save the Waves, because uh, we are working with surfers, the surf community, the surf industry, and surf culture, uh, our mission really is to protect surf ecosystems across the globe. And so surfers are uniquely tied, a very, very place-based uh, set of actors. So we have these places we convene uh, that are really important ecosystems. So when I talk about surf ecosystems, it's really where three elements come together. Breaking waves that you can actually ride are an incredible, valuable resource that don't exist everywhere. It takes a combination of complex coastal processes like the bathymetry, the geology, the geography to make a breaking wave. We also know that these places are really, really important in terms of biodiversity. So that's, those same coastal factors are actually really important habitat for the flora and fauna out there. And we know in a rough study that we did over 75% of the world's best surf spots are actually found uh, in biodiversity hotspots. So there's this huge overlap, meaning these places are actually really globally important. And then last is sort of the socioeconomic component of the surf ecosystem. Uh, we know that these places are really important for people's well-being, like I mentioned. They're really important culturally, and they're really important on an economic level. And that's especially important in the context of the blue economy and in developing countries. So there's a couple key threats to the surf ecosystems out there uh, that really affect the, the, the ecosystem integrity and affect the, um, the experience of riding a wave. And many of these you're familiar with, but largely we're focused on, on plastic and marine debris and water quality as big challenges. As I mentioned before, surfers are that indicator species that you can tell if an ecosystem is healthy or not. So what we do at Save the Waves to try to protect these surf ecosystems is really three strategies that we call protect, steward, and defend to tackle these issues. We use surfing and create unique uh, protected areas around surf locations. We promote stewardship of these places using innovative technology solutions that I'll, I'll talk about here in a second. And then we use popular conservation marketing campaigns, either against something bad or for something good. And so I'm not gonna talk a lot about what else we do. I'm gonna focus on our stewardship strategy but I'm happy to talk offline with anybody about our amazing partnerships on our protected area work with our, our, our partners at the World Surf League and, and Conservation International that's been just an absolute uh, uh, blast to work with and some very, very innovative stuff. We'll talk offline. Um, so on our tech solution, we've developed a platform which the network of the 35 million plus surfers out there in the world can easily uh, be activated and document some of the threats that I've just mentioned. And we think that because of the incentives built in for surfers of wanting to take care of the places that they love, that th we have a mobilized constituency that can be a powerful source of citizen science data for documenting marine threats or marine pollution threats around the world. So really how this works, it's very simple. The mobile app, you take a photo of uh, what's happening at your beach or your, uh, the place that you care about. 
you upload it, you tag your location, and then you're able to take action. So we're chasing this around the world, and we have kind of two data streams. There's passive data and active data. So some of our data goes to inform big uh, you know, institutional arrangement that we have in, in MOUs with local or regional governments with large data sets that NGOs host like Break Free from Plastic or the Global Ghost Gear Initiative, or we have active data. So an example is recently in Peru there was an oil spill and we activated our network of surfers there to be able to document the extent of that problem. So it takes a coalition. We've had a lot of people helping us. And I'd just like to thank our funders at Flotilla Foundation and uh, Schmidt Marine Technology Partners, also our pro bono partners at Valtech and Salesforce. And again, happy to take any questions about uh, how you guys can get involved. You can check out our work at www.savethewaves.org slash mobile app. And I thank you all. Thanks very much, Nick. A very important uh, group of stakeholders that can help. Our next speaker is Simon Bennett, the General Manager for Sustainable Development, Wire and Shipping. Uh, Your Excellencies, uh, Ministers, uh, Special Envoy Carey, good afternoon. Um, once upon a time, um, seven days before the United Nations um, Environment Assembly in Nairobi in 2017, the organizers contacted the delegations and said, the government delegations, and said, bring some business people with you. Luckily, I was a director of the Singapore Environment Council, and I had a valid yellow fever vaccination, so I was the only guy who got to go from the, um, from the council. And that led to fortuitous meetings with SPREP, with the University of Wollongong, and with people in the, in this case, the, plas the marine plastics um, removal tent. The important slide here, a picture is the one on the right. Um, and you can see the title later on, um, on the last slide. or not, as the case may be. Uh, oh. Can we get some assistance okay. with the, oh, there we go. OK, so you're all familiar with this map. This is where we are. Palau's on the, on the west side there. But it's 10% uh, of the world's ocean, 8% um, of, of the world's people um, dependent on um, imports, which is where we come in. I work for Swire Shipping. We've got 40 liner container ships moving around uh, this map here um, with 14 different trade routes coming from West Coast North America um, in the Northeast, China, Korea, Japan, uh, Taiwan in the Northwest on the top left, Australia, um, New Zealand in the bottom, Singapore um, on the left, and all the important countries in the middle. Sadly, embarrassingly, not Palau. Um, you're already served by two other shipping companies doing two port calls a month each, so there's no volume here for us yet. We bring in finished goods on our container ships. Um, we bring in Barbie dolls wrapped in plastic, printer cartridges wrapped in plastic, iPhones wrapped in plastic to the consumers here who want them. They take the plastic off and they throw it away. Um, then we take our empty containers back out of the uh, Pacific, center of the Pacific to the Pacific Rim and fill them with more Barbie dolls, printer cartridges, and iPhones. The waste stays here. Sadly, it goes into landfill for the most part, which eventually gets above the, the land level, then the wind comes through, blows it in the water, little fish eat the plastic, the medium fish eat the little fish, and so on, and the humans eat the big fish. Um, so we are part of the problem. We're bringing the waste in, and we have said we need to be part of the solution. Um, I thought that was clever and original, but Senator Carey said that earlier. Um, uh, the, the, the president said that earlier, and apparently JFK said it um, when I was still young. Um, so that wasn't as original as I thought. We formed um, the Moana Attacker Partnership uh, with SPREP, um, and because we're taking our empty containers back out of the Pacific, um, we said we will give you the container for free, we will give you, uh, we'll give you the freight for free, um, and we will take waste streams out to responsible, certified, competent, sustainable recyclers, um, and then we can bring more Barbie dolls back in again. Um, and that's working quite well. COVID knocked us sideways a little bit, but uh, we're still building up volume. So we're now moving on to the next project in 
conjunction with UNEP and SPREP and the Jeff Islands Daughter Project. Um, the map at the top left-hand corner there is one of our marketing managers driving around Fiji and geotagging every abandoned vehicle they saw. He was on a way to other meetings, so it's not, not rocket science. Um, so we're beginning to build up a baseline of what's available and what needs moving. Our plan is, to, is the pictures you see here. Top left is where we are at the moment. Um, we'll look to, to purchase a, car, a mobile car crusher, top right picture, put them in containers, bottom middle, and the, the result will be the bottom right hand picture in an ideal world. The point of this is the picture uh, that you see but can't read there in the top left hand corner. That's what it says. The UN Science Policy Business Forum on the Environment. This was the first time UNEA had invited business to come to the meeting. And that's a huge step forward. Thank you. Because to affect real solutions, you need academia and NGOs will tell you how big the problem is, where it is, how often it is, and what the potential solutions are. Governance in whichever country or organization or global um, situation you're in will facilitate the environment where the issue can be solved. Historically, that's all that's happened in conferences, and then everyone goes away. They come back a year later, and the academia and NGOs identify the scale of the issue and the potential solutions, and governments make um, an environment where it can be sold. Then they go away at the end of the conference. What you need is business. We do the stuff in the positive environment that's being created to do the identified solution that exists, because that's our day job. So this is a plea to conference organizers, wherever you are, I can't see a thing with the lights on, but please, in Panama and other conferences that you organize, invite business to come, and we will help you solve the problems which governance has allowed to be solved. There are interested organizations like the World Ocean Council, like the Sustainable Shipping Initiative, which is full or, or contains industry leaders who want to make a difference and are keen to help in any way they can, we can, but they just need to be invited and they'll meet in a tent one day and say, we can fix your problem. Thank you. Thank you, very much. Thank you for showing us what highly responsible and innovative business leaders can do. Our last speaker is Ingrid Giskus, the director of the Global Ghost uh, Gear Initiative for the Ocean Conservancy. Good afternoon, delegates, distinguished guests, Ali, everyone. Thank you much, so much for sticking around. I think the last few days has really shown us that the impacts of climate change are all around us. I think we can all agree that it's no longer a question of if climate change will happen, but rather to what degree and how we will respond. As the director of the Global Ghost Gear Initiative at Ocean Conservancy, I'm determined to do my part as well. You may be asking yourself, what is the Global Ghost Gear Initiative and what does it have to do with climate change? The Global Ghost Gear Initiative, or the Triple GI as we call it, is the largest cross-sectoral stakeholder alliance dedicated solely to tackling the problem of lost, abandoned, and otherwise discarded fishing gear worldwide, also called ghost gear. There are a number of things that can cause fishing gear to become ghost gear. Sometimes it's as simple as bad weather conditions. Sometimes it's more complicated due to a lack of improper identification or tracking systems. Without proper identification, it is really difficult to return gear to its owner when it's found. And without proper tracking mechanisms, it's difficult to retrieve gear, and sometimes it makes it even impossible. Some lost gear can continue to ghost fish, a phenomenon that Special Envoy Kerry described as a net in our ocean continuing to rise and fall, entrapping, entangling, and killing marine life. 
And indeed, Ocean Conservancy research has shown that ghost gear is the most harmful form of marine debris. Ghost gear is estimated to cause a responsible decline in 30% of our fish populations, and it also causes considerable damage to our marine habitats. So it's not only a marine pollution uh, issue, it's not only a fisheries issue, it's also a food security issue. And this is exactly where the Triple GI of the Global Ghost Gear Initiative comes in. We unite participants from the fishing industry, businesses, private sector, governments, and academia, and organizations with the best science and technology to all come together to prevent, recover, and reduce ghost gear at global scale. So you're probably still wondering, what does this have to do with climate change? Well, climate change is responsible for a number of harms to the marine environment. We've talked the last few days about warming water temperatures, rising sea levels, ocean acidification, and also an increase in severe weather events. And the impact of climate change threaten our plants, our animals, our fish populations, all the ecosystems that call our ocean home. And this in turn harms the communities, especially the small island communities that rely on this delicate balance of our ecosystems. Ghost gear excavates the same problems as climate change. Both damage marine ecosystems, both are responsible for a reduction in our fish populations, both threaten our food supply, and both are a direct threat to our coastal communities and their livelihoods. Conversely, climate change also excavates the ghost gear problem. Climate change causes more frequent bad weather events, such as hurricanes, and those bad weather events can cause increased loss of gear. Some of our partners are already reporting the impacts of climate change on their fishing operations. During a workshop in small island states in the Caribbean, fishers told us directly that they are losing gear primarily to hurricanes, bad weather events, the impacts of climate change. And they also expressed a deep, deep concern that as climate change and the impacts are increasing, so will their gear losses and so will be their loss of livelihood. They asked us to do more to help them to prevent, mitigate and remediate their gear loss. And one way that the Triple GI is doing that is through the incorporation of tracking technologies and conducting gear technology trials. Those trials are vital both to help the retrieval of fishing gear, but also to mitigate the impacts of ghost fishing as I described earlier. The Triple GI has successfully conducted gear marking trials in Indonesia and the South Pacific, and we're currently also trialing um, a pilot project in Jamaica in the spiny lobster fishery together with the fisher community there. Working together with these fishing communities is really helping them prepare and mitigate climate change so that they can look to forward to a more sustainable future. Gear loss to protect our marine environments really is just one way where the Triple GI and Ocean Conservancy are, wo are working together to address the, the impacts of climate change. As we've heard over the last four, four days, it really takes an all hands on deck approach. Partnerships, partnerships, partnerships. Fishers, governments, private sector, academia, NGOs, everyone needs together to be part of the solution, as we've heard. And that's why I'm also so pleased to announce that two more governments are joining the Global Ghost Gear Initiative today. We have the government of Spain as our first Mediterranean government and the government of the Republic of Korea as our first Asian government joining the Global Ghost Gear Initiative to address gear loss at global scale. I know that we... <laughs> So we now have 20 governments in the initiative and 130 organizations. So I'm really confident that although there's still a lot of work that needs to be done, a lot of work ahead of us, the Triple GI is so excited and so proud to work alongside all of these incredible, incredible partners to work towards a resilient, healthy, and hopefully ghost gear free for ocean for all. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you all for giving us really good options and solutions moving forward. So we're now going to move into our uh, question and answer period. And the first question is for Tania. How can multi-stakeholder collaborative action or the Gotong Rayong principle be adjusted with different cultures or global values? 
Sure, thank you. I think gotong royong principles somehow uh, being uh, discussed a lot through collaborations, but I think it's missing two aspects. The first one is the access to do co-creation um, action with the youth, and the second is actually the policy framework that needs to be done fast. So what I mean is the first one, um, the youth is actually a perfect catalysator for behavior change. Uh, based on our experiences where we got supported by the USAID through municipal waste recycling program or through BMZ, through the FINLA program, we actually success to make more than 5,000 households or like 29 neighborhoods or more actually can separate their waste and gain income out of it. And the reduction rate of waste is also increasing as long as the recycling rate, uh, which is increasing, uh, which we found that there's a lot of uh, hinder process that caused by me Maybe the working on silos process that maybe the elder generations sometimes uh, facing. So that's the first one. So I need more, uh, I urge more access to youth to actually make the change and not necessarily means funding, but also by involving them, like the local villagers or like the ministries, make youth a part of your team. And the second one is the faster policy framework that needs, uh, that needed. Because this is actually my fourth Our Ocean Youth Summit um, and the plenary itself, but this is my first time speaking. But actually, uh, in the islands, I still found like single-use plastic sachets. I, I didn't see like the 100%, um, you know, reusable, refillable, recyclable products, which we cannot wait for like the next 10 years. So the the private sectors uh, need frameworks, and also like we we kind of forced to believe that. Uh, economic and also environment need to be choose because we are developing countries. And developing versus developed countries, this is something that you guys should work on. Because, you know, private sectors wants to change, but for example, the virgin plastic is actually cheaper, way cheaper than the recycled plastics. Then how can we move on to circular like fast enough? So I think this needs really like, just like what I said earlier, that we need to sweeping in unison, like fishes, like schooling fishes. There are big fishes, there's like small fishes, and the youth are like the small fishes that we, we act, act, act as a catalysator. But the big fishes are you guys, like the high level one. You need like do the big job done, right? Because we're not going to see changes if these are not being addressed. So yeah, I think it needs to be addressed more. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Tania. Uh, Minister Chang. Um, how does Taiwan achieve a garbage recycling rate of 60%? It's quite impressive. Thank you. Um, we have designed a comprehensive plan, recycling plan, and it collects the recycling fee from the uh, product makers to fund the recycling of uh, like, uh, plastic containers and the other uh, 12 categories of uh, recyclable items. Also, the public is uh, also encouraged to recycle. So, so that they, they, the, the more they recycle, the more they save on their garbage collection fee. Also, we, we rely on the environmental education. Taiwan is one of the few countries that have passed the legislation in this area. Environmental education is now Require from the uh, elementary to high school. So all these measures help us to reach the uh, high recycling rate. So we can reach the 60% the, uh, of the recycling. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Minister. <clears throat> uh, Nick, next question is for you. Uh, with so many eyes and ears and boards in the water, <laughs> how specifically could this work with protected areas management and enforcement? Yeah, I think um, coming back to the app, you know, it's it's a very easy way uh, to engage, as I said, to engage a constituency in sort of monitoring the the health and threats that are out there. And I know one of the challenges that the other other MPA panel spoke about is really enforcement, and that there's such these huge areas, but only a few people to actually be the eyes and ears of the management plans to make sure that they're enforced. And so I think this technology is really applicable because almost everybody has this supercomputer in their pocket. And so gathering that data can be, uh, can be relatively easy, again, if you have a motivated and incentivized uh, constituency to do so. 
So I think this is pretty applicable to rolling up to management plan goals and objectives within protected areas, and that's something we're hoping to work on with our, our Surf Protected Area Networks program as well as a, as a next step and working with some of our partners to, to kind of unroll that and maybe take some of the pressure off of those four protected area managers out there. Great. Well, thank you very much for that. It's a very you. good option. Um, Simon, you, for your candor and bravery and uh, kind of owning up <laughs> to the shipping industry, you won the prize for the longest question. Swire Shipping freely and refreshingly admits that you are therefore part of the problem, so you wish to be part of the solution. Swire Shipping has been working with UNEP, SPREP, and PRIF on baseline study to go beyond your existing Moanataka partnership, which uses your spare backload capacity to move bulky waste to recycling markets. I understand the findings of the three-month study will be issued in the next couple of weeks. Um, could you give us a sneak peek of its findings? Okay, so the answer is ARFD. That's the shortest answer to the longest question. <laughs> um, it's um, Advanced Recovery Fee Deposit. About 80 years ago, when I was young, they used to charge threepence a bottle for soft drinks deposit, and you could guarantee that me and my friends collected every bottle that was available and returned it. Nothing was ever thrown away because away is always actually somewhere, somewhere else. It's not where you are. The study said that none of the recycling schemes that we looked at were going to be cost effective on their own, via economically viable. And of course, if they were, somebody would have done it already and they wouldn't need us to do a study and have a look at it. What is missing is um, ARFD, that when you buy a car or a fridge or a microwave or a can of soft drinks or whatever, or a bottle of soft drinks, there's a deposit on that which you get back when you return it. And that incentivizes the consumers to return the waste, um, rather than take the car out at the end of its life and just abandon it in a, in a mangrove somewhere. Um, if we can, uh, the, uh, studies have been done, some of the Pacific nations um, ha one of them has a scheme already, many are looking at it, some are not quite ready to look at it yet, but that would fill the funding gap um, and that would allow a material amount of, of waste to not end up in the environment where it leaks hazardous chemicals like POPs, um, where it destroys the environment and puts tourists off, which is a large part of the GDP of, of many of the Pacific Islands. So it's a win for absolutely everyone involved um, in the scheme. We really need to see that going forwards, please. Great, thank you very much. And Ingrid, the final question for you is, what's a common misconception about Ghost Gear? Yeah, very good question. Um, I think Ghost Gear is very much an issue that is out of sight, out of mind a little bit. Um, it happens below the ocean surface. So I think there's a lot of misconceptions about Ghost Gear. But one of the ones that we encounter most often when we speak with stakeholders is that they think fishers are to blame for this issue of ghost gear, whereas in fact they're one of our strongest allies on the, fisher, uh, on the issue. Um, no fisher wants to lose their gear. It's expensive to replace, it's expensive to retrieve, either in the cost of the gear itself or lost fishing time. And fishers are really um, stewards of the ocean. They're at the front line of this. They see the issue every day, and they also rely on a healthy ocean for their livelihoods. So we found that instead of the culprits of the issue, um, they're really our strongest allies to be part of the solution. Of course, there is a link with illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. It's quite the mouthful. Um, so with IUU fishing, but that is only really a small percentage of the gear that is ending up in our ocean. And so we work really with um, fisher communities, fishers directly, um, not only to transfer technology, to build capacity, but also really to learn from these indigenous communities um, what we can do to solve the problem, because often the solution is already there. Um, and so it's an exchange of information and learning from them as well as, as much as trying to build capacity in those communities. So. Short answer is, uh, fishers are really our allies um, on the issue when it comes to addressing ghost gear. Great, thank you very much. Thanks <clears throat> to the panelists. And just to finish up for the panel, um, it becomes abundantly clear, at least to me, in a series of talks that sometimes become overwhelming. I don't know about you, but there are times when I look at the data 
I look at my colleagues, I look at everything that's going on, all the challenges that have come up. It's also wonderful to hear all the solutions that are being provided. And I think for me that drives home a degree of optimism. I tell people personally I'm an optimist, otherwise I can't get out of bed in the morning. Professionally I'm a pragmatist, otherwise I can't do my job. But I think it's abundantly clear from hearing these talks and the talks throughout the uh, conference so far um, that our oceans and the people who depend on them are threatened but not doomed. And it's totally up to us and how hard we can work together in partnerships, um, in creative solutions to make a difference.